ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator of one of the last sessions of Globsec 2021, Emily Tamkin. Hello, everyone. Uh, last afternoon here at Globsec, we are in the home stretch. And thank you for being with us. Um, we know that there are other events going on. We appreciate you being here. Uh, this is only a 50 minute panel, which is not very much time to discuss great power competition in East Asia, the subject of this discussion. Um, so we are going to keep it conversational, lively, and it's meant to be a discussion. So please do join in. There will be an opportunity to ask questions either here in this room, uh, we have Zoom questions, and there is, uh, you can obviously submit them through the Globesec app. To start out, I'm going to introduce our distinguished panelists. They need no introduction, but that's my job, so here we go. Um, there <laughs> is Yasuhira Nakamaya. He is the State Minister of Defense, joining us from Japan. We have Bruno Masayich here in person. He is a Senior Research Associate at the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies. From my city, DC, we have Tori Tasig. She is a non-resident fellow at Brookings. And then we have here Kinga Brujinska, uh, policy Director at the Center for Global Europe at Globsec. Thank you all so much for being with me today. Bruno, I want to start with you, so I will. Um, you know, before we get into this discussion, which assumes that there is great power competition, I've had some discussions with people outside of the United States who say there is no great power competition. This is a framing invented by the Americans to justify opposition to China, to keep themselves relevant in the world, etc. What do you make of that? Uh, well, you, you, you could make that argument. Uh, I think uh, the idea of great power competition is, is very popular outside the US, actually. It's very popular in Moscow, for example. Uh, it seems to refer to the idea that there are different poles of power. In fact, when I listen to President Biden these days, it seems to me that he's abandoning a bit the notion of great power competition. He's going back to an older notion of a global liberal order. Mm. And the power is rooted in the global liberal order. The United States stands as a kind of enforcer of that order. But when we talked about great power competition in, in, in the latest administration and the strategy papers that came out, the notion was that the global liberal order had eroded and we were a bit back in the jungle with different poles of power and a certain uncertainty about uh, the number of those powers. We knew that China, the United States, but then the question is whether the European Union was part of it questions whether India could, could rise to that position and qu questions about whether Russia had a role to play in this great power competition. Uh, but clearly, to me, the idea of great power competition means that uh, each of these poles has its own ideological model. Each of these poles has its own center of power, uh, is self-sufficient in some sense. And so the question is, is this really the case or should we still think that something like a global order still exists uh, and still provides stability. Uh, mm. And, you know, for some people, uh, it was it was just Trump that didn't believe in the global liberal order, but it's still solid. And for others, that order no longer makes sense. It's impossible to enforce. How do we enforce something against China? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the question that the Biden administration will have to answer. How do we enforce something against Russia? How do we enforce something against uh, against China. Right now, we see that there's powers of enforcement being quite weak. Mm. Well, this is actually related to our poll question, which is, what percentage of Central and Eastern Europeans is worried about China's rising economic power? So if you have the Globesec app, you can respond to this poll, and we will read out the answers at the end. Um, I want to go now to Minister Nakayama. Firstly, I apologize for mispronouncing your last name in the opening remarks. Second of all, could you, I mean, this is about great power competition in East Asia. You are the only participant who is in East Asia. Can you give us the view from Japan? Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, my Japanese name is so complicated always. So uh, this is not your fault. Thank you, anyway. So uh, nice meeting you. I'm from Japan and uh, I, uh, I am uh, living just uh, right in front of China. And uh, I know that uh, they are communist, uh, you know, the ruling party is a communist party. And, uh, you know, in 1997, uh, as you can see, what's, what's, what's going on at the Hong Kong issue or the human rights in Wigel or the another issue about, the, you know, AI, like, uh, I mean, AI is 
is actually that there is a two meanings for China. One AI is an artificial island. The other AI is artificial intelligence. So the so the uh, lots of dimensions uh, what we have to discuss about. But uh, unfortunately, the uh, the China held the National People's Congress in March and announced that the its defense budget for uh, fiscal year 2021 was a approximately uh, US dollar two, 202 billion, uh, represented uh, growth of approximately 6.8% uh, compared to the uh, previous fiscal year. So the, uh, the China, uh, even the after Corona, uh, they are increasing the, the budget for the military. And uh, so, and especially uh, we are really concerned about the, uh, China between Taiwan, there is a uh, Taiwan strike. Uh, we have a concern about uh, uh, the day before yesterday, the Chinese Air Force uh, invaded uh, to the uh, Taiwanese uh, territory, ter territorial, you know, the sky uh, above Taiwan. So those kind of uh, uh, very uh, uh, naughty activity by Chinese PLA uh, towards Taiwan, it's now uh, the increasing the numbers of the, the time. So, uh, and also uh, when you focus to the, uh, the East, China, East, East China Sea and South China Sea, uh, I brought uh, like this uh, photograph from the uh, satellite. Uh, this, this, uh, this shell Island, used to be just a leaf, you know, very good. It's a very natural reef. Mm -hmm. But within two, three years, we made a very, very long runway with a military base. So you can see more uh, close to uh, uh, four kilometers runway in, in this artificial island. So the, the lots of European countries are uh, coming towards the uh, South China Sea right now, and also the U.S. military forces are uh, concerned about the, the area uh, we are talking uh, about. And uh, today I'm really glad that uh, joining this forum, but the, this forum actually held in Europe. And the, now, the, now the people who are talking about this issue is... Uh, came from the United States, uh, which we are our allies. And uh, I'd like to say and mention that uh, the globe is a, it's a round. And the internet also, there is no border mm -hmm. in this century. So we have to talk, not just the, not just the uh, trans, transatlantic relationship, but we also have to talk about the Asia issue. Because of this Taiwan Strait issue, is going to be relate to the all whole nations. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a lot to unpack there that we're going to come back to throughout this discussion. But right now I want to talk about, you know, we're, Minister, you mentioned this military conflict, but there's also a, a political conflict, right? Or with what kind of governance systems are we going to live under? Um, Tori, you wrote a piece just recently that basically said that um, you know, countries that are standing up to China, and I apologize if I'm summarizing it incorrectly, you can, you can push back, but basically the countries that are standing up to China can, can do so democratically, right, can bolster the democratic institutions, and that this will be an effective way to counter China. But, you know, in the United States, whether or not you protect voting rights has become a partisan issue. There are examples throughout Europe of uh, democratic backsliding or, or whatever phrase you want to use to describe it. So my question is, how can these countries that are democratic and are, are standing up to China, how can they say they're doing that for democracy when democracy is not being taken care of at home? Big question. Uh, first, Emily, thank you for, for introducing this, this panel. It's nice to be with everyone here today, albeit virtually. Uh, Emily, I think your framing is right. So if we take a step back and look at how the Biden administration is 
crafting its early worldview. I would say to start, it was interesting to me that in the interim national security guidance, there actually was no reference to great power competition. I think there are a number of reasons for that. One is because Russia and China are not seen on the same level of strategic competition. I think that makes sense. But more broadly, um, the, the framing for this administration's foreign policy agenda is in a global competition between authoritarian and democratic states. China is clearly a central feature of that. Uh, but another central feature of that is that the United States seeks to rally the world's democracies to take on significant transnational challenges, whether that be China, climate change, recovering from the global pandemic. And I think that's what we saw the president do on this uh, international trip to Europe, which is just wrapping up. He wants to show that America is back, but that it is capable of rallying the world's democracy, democracies. So yes, you bring up a key tension that some of the world's strongest industrial democracies are backsliding internally on a number of metrics. I think the administration recognizes that and seeks to strengthen our internal foundations, uh, whether that be on voting rights, uh, but also just presenting a strong democratic model for the world. And this is going to be a big challenge for the US, Europe, uh, European and Asian democracies to present a strong uh, internal model Model so that we can take on critical transnational challenges together. Um, to close, I think you bring up an important tension, but it is one that is acknowledged in um, this administration's approach to its European and its Asian democratic partners. Thank you so much. Kinga, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, you also recently have a report out. Could you tell us a bit about that and what your, you know, your conclusions are about the current state of great power competition? Thank you very much, Emily, and, and uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Um, I wanted to build up, and actually, I think Bruno and uh, Torres' uh, remarks uh, about building a, a democratic alternative uh, has uh, also nicely uh, um, sums up, or it was also discussed during the G7, G7 summit um, uh, recently, uh, where, uh, where President Biden also mentioned that there needs to be a new uh, initiative and we also heard in the past about the uh, uh, d10 summit that is uh, um, in the making and uh, we uh, we will see what happens i think the important uh, re of course the competition is going on but but uh, despite and regardless the new initiatives uh, the most important part of it is that they deliver and they bring uh, tangible results because we've seen many initiatives uh, there is a community of democracies uh, there are different dis institutions that uh, um, the, um, their mission is to uh, some more support democracies um, abroad, uh, but uh, if they don't deliver, uh, then the, uh, um, uh, the um, effects might be actually bring some ne negative uh, uh, effects. Uh, there was also an initiative of uh, building uh, back a better world that was announced as well. Uh, and um, this Some people like the slogan so much they you know, uh, <laughs> adopted it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we will see, but it's a, it's a great time, it's a good momentum and it's good to to see that uh, America is back as well. And uh, I think both uh, America and Europe needs each other to, uh, to work on, uh, on issues, even though they don't agree. Uh, uh, on, on everything on, on global power such as, uh, such as China. I have a follow up, which is, you know, you just said America is back. Biden himself has repeatedly said America is back. Um, but we still have a highly polarized country. We have midterms in 2022, the presidential election 2024. Um, is there a sense in, in Europe, particularly in this part of Europe, that, okay, Biden's back, he's saying the right things, but it could be reversed like that. And in the meantime, we've gotten increasingly adversarial toward Russia and to China. Yeah, I think you are right. There is a feeling that, I, that America is back, but there is also understanding that is, this is not the same America that uh, we used to see, but especially if we are talking about this region, uh, this region has never uh, been uh, um, left uh, America from its orbit. Mm -hmm. For example, you, we, you mentioned uh, our report, we just published a report on strategic autonomy from uh, Central and Eastern uh, European view or perspectives. It's, it's not a report that has a country chapters, but rather we brought together 
authors from the region to discuss the topic. And, and this topic was, uh, was uh, strategic autonomy discussions in Europe has started way before the COVID uh, um, uh, pandemic. But uh, the, uh, all the authors, for example, say that regardless we want or not, uh, the, the strategic autonomy of some sorts will, uh, will be uh, with us mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the medium or uh, long term. But of course, the div uh, devil lies in the details. And also what every single author of this report said that, yes, Central Europe will not oppose it, but it must not lead into uh, the coupling and the transatlantic bond is something that, that uh, uh, is important for this region and, uh, and this is the, the whole uh, premise. Um, Bruno, a question for you. You know, with great power competition, it's, it's easy to see what this means. Well, maybe not easy, but it's, it's clearer or easier to see what this means for the United States, for Russia, for China, for Japan, for India. Um, is there concern that for smaller countries, say in Europe, or, or around the world that they get left behind and lost in the shuffle of between the great powers? It, it's a big concern for, for lots of medium-sized powers. Uh, I get that question all the time. Can a country uh, afford not to choose? Mm. You know, Singapore would probably not like to be forced to choose necessarily in all dimensions between China and the United States as strong economic links. Um, there are other countries uh, who who are forced, in a way, to to pick a side, and that was the story in the Cold War. I'm not sure it's going to be the story here. Um, I see opportunities for countries to play both sides, and mm. some are trying that. When it comes to Europe, Ooh, uh, name names. Uh, so I, well, you know, some very successful countries have developed close ties with, with China, even in Europe. Switzerland is a good case. Switzerland has a free trade agreement with China and they seem to be happy with it. Um, they don't have the same, you know, they have a, a history of neutrality that allows them yep. not to be necessarily forced to align with the United States on everything. They can say no. Now, the question is, is this going to be in the end successful or not? Uh, or in the end, they're going to be forced to choose. Uh, when it comes to Europe, I, I remember meeting Minister Nakayama in 2015. Uh, and he was always insisting, I think also with other European counterparts, that Europe has to wake up. Mm -hmm. And the question which he referred to today as well is, you know, the economic links, particularly between East Asia and Europe, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, are they going to be controlled by China in the end? Are those trade routes going to be controlled by China? The ports, the massive ports that are being constructed, freedom of navigation. This is an issue where Europe has to be very, very active. Mm. Uh, we cannot afford to become a fortress isolated from the world. Mm. Uh, so the idea that, in a way, we have to be present in Asia is becoming uh, recognized in Brussels. Uh, you have some European countries developing Indo-Pacific strategies. You have the European Commission having, two years ago, a big summit with the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, ideas to do the same with India. So I think, I think Minister Nakayama was right back then in 2015. This is an issue also for Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to be present in, in Asia. Well, so I'd like to go now to, to Minister Nakayama and ask, do you think that Europe and the rest of the world have woken up? Um, if so, when did they wake up and why? And if not, kind of what is it going to take? So uh, what the Japan hopes now uh, to maintain and uh, reinforce the vision of FOIP uh, is to further develop our relationship with the uh, uh, European Union as a, a strategic partner uh, that we can act together uh, with to establish world peace and security and stability uh, based on common values uh, such as democracy and rule of law uh, and uh, principles. And, uh, you know, we can make a promise, and, uh, but the, some country uh, sometimes uh, break the rules. So we are democratic countries uh, have to unite and uh, we need to uh, add more friends to make a strong, strong strengthening uh, have to against uh, the, uh, uh, you know, give the uh, bad influence to their uh, neighboring country or even uh, not neighboring country. Because uh, now the time, uh, you can attack 
uh, even not geopolitically close. Uh, you can attack another country uh, through the internet or cyber attacks. So uh, our friends and the needs is, uh, you know, all over the world. So the Bruno said, uh, uh, we have to wake up, means uh, we have to wake up now. And when, when 2015, uh, I was a, a state minister for foreign affairs, and I attended uh, all the cybersecurity conference held at the Europe, held at the uh, North America. And uh, I felt uh, at that time already, uh, I feel that the uh, new Cold War exists in the cyberspace. So that means Russia and China uh, already collaborate, collaborating on the cybers, uh, cyber world. And the uh, United States and Japan uh, is, you know, collaborating. And uh, the internet field for China, Chinese and the Russians, I think that they want to control everything. But uh, for the United States and Japan, a uh, country like Japan, we want to use internet field to emphasize the economy, to make more strong and free economy. So uh, I hope the new president of the United States, uh, Mr. Joe Biden, uh, become a strong to make a strong leadership to the democratic uh, nations and to call upon the uh, everybody get together to to how do you say to 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 protect the uh, democratic uh, world and uh, not just the chasing between the uh, communist country uh, but uh, also uh, uh, we have to bring them. Uh, bring them into the, uh, the, uh, the stage uh, that we can talk more freely and also uh, talk more honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one last question that I'm going to put to Tori before opening it up to audience questions. Again, we have Zoom questions. You can ask via the app. And if you're here with me in this room, we have a microphone um, that you can get up to and ask. We just ask that you please not touch the mic as we are still in a global pandemic. Um, Tori, my question for you, you know, so we have this great power competition, right? We, we're, we're in this adversarial relationship. On the other hand, we have issues like the global pandemic, like climate change um, that we kind of can't address if we aren't cooperating to some extent. So how do you, how do we balance the two, right? The reality that there are these, um, you know, aggressive autocratic uh, countries that are on the ascent, like um, on the ascent. And on the other hand, that there are existential challenges that we need to work out. Right, it's a, it's a great point. And I'll answer that by picking up on a thread that uh, Bruno raised, um, which is in the United States asking allies or partners to choose between the United States and China. It brings up this idea of decoupling that um, I think was prominent during the Trump administration. But I'd like to debunk both of those uh, terms before moving on to your to your question. One, I don't think that the United States uh, under the Biden administration, nor even under um, the Trump administration really was looking at decoupling uh, between the West and China, the United States and China as a viable policy option. Um, it is clear that we operate in an interconnected web of technologies and economies and that that is not possible in today's world. The second idea of asking allies and partners to choose, I also do not think is on the table in the Biden administration's foreign policy agenda either, because the United States recognizes that uh, many of its allies and partners in Europe and in Asia rely fundamentally on China's economy and that if we asked allies and partners to choose, we may not like the answer. So I, I think there is more complexity to U.S. foreign policy now than to put it in terms of decoupling and, and uh, asking allies and partners to choose. So I think that that's an important thread to start from. But another reason that these are not viable options is, Emily, because as you mentioned, we're dealing with transnational challenges that will require cooperation between democratic and authoritarian partners. And I think that we can look at the, the US-Russia summit that just concluded to show that um, this, is, this is possible and that it is um, necessary. You know, we look at 
uh, nuclear issues, for example, being a transnational challenge that we have to deal with. The United States and Russia, I would say, are on a pretty adversarial footing at the moment, yet uh, Presidents Biden and Putin recognize that as the two world's largest nuclear powers, we need to have a sense of stability in this relationship to ensure that uh, peace remains. That's one. You know, we also have our, you know, looking at the relationship with China, it's very clear that we are going to need to cooperate with China on big issues like climate change, but also on pandemic recovery, addressing the next pandemic, should there ever be one, and that we need to keep uh, channels of dialogue and communication and engagement open so that we can deal with these big transnational challenges, like I mentioned, nuclear issues, climate change, um, pandemics. Uh, this is going to require cooperation and dialogue with authoritarian states, with peer competitors, with adversaries. And I think that that's very much woven into the fabric and understanding of this administration's outlook right now. Okay, so we have about half the session left. We're going to go to questions now. Um, we have one from the app, which reads, it's anonymous. It reads, is military still the main area of competition between great powers such as China and the US or are geoeconomics and technology more important in that regard? Um, Kinga, because you just had this report on strategic autonomy come out, I would like you to, to take a stab. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Emily. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely the, the second one. And uh, we we were also discussing, and this is also, uh, I will refer maybe to, to the, uh, the, the argument that uh, if uh, Europe wakes up or not when it comes to the global competition, but uh, I think it definitely does. Of course, there is a, uh, there is a division between those who think that Europe uh, is, you know, too slow, mm -hmm. does not do enough. But uh, on the other hand, I, I started just to write down, you know, we what you did in this regard and it's it's not enough we all know that member states national interests are divided there is no common position on china russia but there are attempts from this bureaucratic machine in in, in brussels uh, the, we have a geopolitical commission even it uh, probably um, uh, expect sets expectations too high to what it can deliver but there is a global thinking about it we have also the new agenda for multilateralism when the EU states that uh, that uh, um, it will uh, um, that this pragmatic approach and cooperation and approach to China. Uh, this is something that uh, that the EU is also looking for, and and member states are actually reading for more interest-driven uh, EU. And also, we member states are working on the strategic compass also to uh, to uh, bring the the positions closer or that analyze together different threats. Uh, so I definitely think that that Europe has has woke up to the geopolitical uh, uh, challenges and is, is seeking for uh, uh, its role on, on the global stage. Um, and um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just uh, the time when the EU will, will uh, arrive mm. there. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have a Zoom question. So if the producers could, could bring us that query. They're not ready yet with the Zoom question, but that's fine. Um, okay, does anyone in the room have a question? Okay, no, we have another one you. from uh, the app, which is, uh, it's a two-parter from Dimitar Lilkov of the Martin Center. One, will the Quad Alliance, US, Australia, India, Japan, become more prominent in the future? And then the second part is Japan's view. Does the EU recognize the importance of Southeast Asia? Um, so I'm going to have Tori take the first one, and then we'll go to, to the minister. So Tori, um, will the Quad Alliance become more important in the future, do you think? Short answer, yes. I think we're already seeing the Quad play a pretty prominent role in uh, the U.S. approach to the Indo-Pacific currently. The fact that we had the first leaders meeting of the Quad early on in the Biden administration, I think is important. Um, I think it will become an organizing principle for dealing with challenges from China in the region, but also um, a more positive and affirmative vision, dealing with vaccine distribution. Um, there is a, I think, a, a working group for critical and emerging technologies that is taking place within the quad format. And uh, yes, absolutely, I think that this will be a, an important organizing principle for US engagement in the region. I would be curious to hear from our Japanese counterparts whether he sees um, a, a concrete real role for the EU within, or European partners within the Quad, but on that I defer to my colleague. Um, so let's go now to, to Minister uh, Nakayama. Do you think that, well, first of all, does the EU recognize the importance of Southeast Asia? And 
can is there a role for the EU in the Quad? Or with the um, I think I, I'm so sure that the uh, for example the this April this year. Uh, Europe, European Union too has announced its strategy to cooperate in uh, in in the uh, Indo-Pacific, and uh, also the uh, what it, what this strategy uh, advocates is exactly in harmon harmony with what the Japan promotes in the FOI vision. Uh, in particular, as Defense min uh, Minister, I highly commend uh, commend on the point uh, that the EU strategy sets out. Uh, the strengthening of uh, presence and action in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, on a related note, we are uh, seeing a closer collaboration with each of the European nations. Uh, last month, uh, we conducted uh, a multilateral exercise called ARC-21 with France and United States and Australia. Uh, that involved uh, training um, uh, menus uh, such as relation, uh, replenishment at sea, uh, RAS, and uh, landing ashore. Uh, not only uh, were we able to uh, demonstrate uh, our resolution to uh, protect our, our remote islands, uh, but we were uh, also able to show off our solid uh, collaboration between Japan and France and the Indo-Pacific to our domestic and international audience. Uh, moreover, as an effort uh, not to lose uh, the moment, uh, momentum of the exercise, uh, each, of the, each of the chief of staff from uh, ground, uh, maritime and air staff officers, office, offices engaged in VTCs uh, with their France uh, counterparts and share views regarding defense cooperation uh, going forward. And also the uh, United Kingdom, Kingdom uh, is going to send uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth. And so uh, I think, and also uh, the Germany too. So the, all the European Union countries are uh, really focusing on uh, uh, this region, Northeast Asia, but, and also the South, Southeast Asia. But uh, unfortunately, honestly speaking, the, the Taiwan issue is, uh, I think, the, more, the most biggest issue. And uh, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, we have a Honolulu, uh, there is a indo pacom of the United States, 7th Fleet Base. Uh, I think the Pacific Ocean is very uh, big value and asset uh, for, for not just the uh, Asian country, but also the Indian Ocean countries and even the Europeans. Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, map, uh, this is uh, South China Sea. And if the Chinese submarine uh, launch the longest distance missile towards the North America, it already reaches to the White House. And that means whole the nation, including Europe, is already uh, inside of the range of the Chinese uh, nuclear weapons. It's a, it's a possibility. But uh, we, we have to unite. And uh, uh, this issue and the, uh, the concern uh, we have to talk about uh, like this situation. So, and uh, I don't know about the, the Quad future, uh, but Quad, it's, it's, it's kind of like examples of the how we make a good friends, uh, which we have a mutual uh, profit for the future, and it will. So thank you very much. Mm. Bruno, I'd like to put the same questions to you, but from the European perspective. So do you think that the EU recognizes uh, the importance of Southeast Asia? And what is the role for Europe with the Quad? Yes, it does. Uh, the uh, high representative just came back from Indonesia. Uh, there was actually a very good reaction. Lots of op-eds in the Straits Times and, and other regional newspapers. Uh, the idea, again, is we have very strong trade links and economic links, but that's not quite enough. They have to be protected politically and perhaps even militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue, you asked this question earlier, just a side note. So far, the competition has been mostly economic and technological. But there's, of course, a question whether Chinese authorities decide to change the nature of this competition mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, 
By the way, finding that competition in the economic sphere is becoming very difficult. Uh, and therefore, then the question of Taiwan and other questions could, could, could be raised. Uh, it's possible that China would divert great power competition to the military sphere at some point. Uh, that could be the story for the next decade. And there, I remain very skeptical that the European Union can do a lot. The question, as it's usually posed in, in Brussels and Washington, is should Europe have a military presence in Southeast Asia um, and South Asia, or should it focus on Europe, therefore freeing American resources to be more focused on Asia? Mm -hmm. I think that's a dialogue that's happening between the United States and Europe. Uh, Probably what's going to happen, maybe Minister Nakayama will, will disagree, but probably what's going to happen is that Europe is going to be more focused on its eastern borders. Um, European resources are going to be used to face uh, Russia, and that U.S. will slowly divert its attention to South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Philippines. Uh, let me just finish with one thought. Maybe I, I, you won't come back to me. Uh, it's been interesting, this discussion, uh, the question of values, because when you talk about great power competition and during the Trump administration, it seemed to be uh, the sort of leaving behind the values question and focusing on power. And that's very much a question that is alive. So far, the Biden administration has really concentrated its attention on, the, on democracies. Mm. India, Japan, South Korea have deserved prime treatment from the administration. But soon enough, we're going to have a very serious question whether the United States is going to engage with Vietnam, mm -hmm. is going to engage with the Philippines. In particular, uh, of course, lots of, of questions about Duterte there, uh, Thailand. Uh, and then uh, that raises the question of, of whether uh, values should be the main consideration or power should be the main consideration. Uh, and uh, I, I, I personally think that the United States will be forced sooner or later to be a bit more flexible in its approach if it wants to balance Chinese power in mm -hmm. Asia. So we have another question. This one comes to us from Jack Dalrymple. How successful do you think China's Belt and Road Initiative has been? And what do you think should be Europe's response to these efforts to influence, influence countries? Kinga, I will go to you. Yeah, I think we, we've just seen the, the, the response and, and the G7, uh, G7 summit uh, conclusions or recommendations that, that the world is thinking about this question. And, uh, and uh, there is a, uh, actually a real understanding that those alternatives must be delivered if uh, the, the world, uh, uh, um, if democracies want to shape uh, and influence uh, uh, the world uh, uh, as well. So uh, I think uh, Chinese were very smart in this uh, in this approach with this initiative, and uh, from their perspective, it is. Um, uh, it is uh, successful. Uh, what uh, it's often also that this region is criticized for for the uh, 16 now uh, uh, one plus one summit, and uh, it comes up in our report, but also discussions that we have in the region as well is that the Central and Eastern European countries are more and more kind of disappointed with uh, with uh, the the Chinese approach, and they often we often say it's not uh, 16 plus one, but one plus 16 because mm -hmm. uh, because the states. Uh, 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 are aware and, and they cannot influence that much the agenda, the right. format, the setup. So, so uh, um, it has been highly criticized, but there is also a reflection in the region that this is not the format that, for example, uh, brings that much mm -hmm. uh, to the region. And we've seen Lithuania leaving it. So uh, um, we will see what, what happens and how also this is integrated uh, on the EU level, but um, we also know that uh, other member states also have their different policies. So uh, mm -hmm. I would end here. Right? OK, um, we have another anonymous question. This says economy, resources and technology concern concern strategic autonomy, how to keep the autonomy economically. Um, Tori, I'd like to go back to you because you spoke earlier about how we're not act we're, we're not really going to decouple economically. Um, what are your thoughts on this question? How, how, do you, how do you remain economically autonomous in a great power world? Uh, big question. Um, and there are a couple of things I'd like to pick up on from what Bruno and, and Kinga have said as well. But to address this issue, um, you know, I think the, the best way for 
European powers and for the European Union to engage in what we might call a great game of, of great power competition, however you want to phrase it, is through its economic weight and its regulatory power. We haven't really brought up this idea of regulatory power yet. And this is where the European Union and the European market um, have a tremendous amount of weight on the world stage and can influence how companies and powers engage at home in the world's largest market. Um, so I think looking ahead, we're going to see the European Commission really lean into that, its economic and its regulatory power to engage among great powers like the United States, Russia, and China. So that's one point. Um, I want to go back to uh, the question on BRI and development, because I completely agree with Kenya that I think there's a lot of disappointment and disillusionment with what China is offering to both industrialized and developing countries in its um, very loan heavy uh, model and also just in the, the disappointment around what China has been able to follow through on infrastructure wise. And so I think the time is right for industrialized democracies, the United States, Europe, other uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific like Japan to really present viable alternatives to China's BRI. And honestly, I don't think we're, we're there yet. I think, you know, the, the European Asian connectivity strategy, the United States blue dot network and init development initiatives like this are not, they don't have the political weight and the economic investment behind them to currently present uh, viable alternatives. And I really think we need to lean into uh, the development angle of our soft power influence around the world. So I think uh, development is going to be critical to our ability to compete economically with key regions around the world now and going forward. Great. So we have another question. This one comes from A. Tothova. Toth 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 uh, it's a question for Minister Nakayama. Where do you see the future of EU-Japan cooperation? What are the areas where it could be strengthened? Minister. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'd like to say that, you know, the, for example, think about the Chinese activities right now. Uh, we are really concerned about uh, unilateral attempts to change the status quo. And, uh, but these kind of things, not just happening on the earth, but also the outer space. So, uh, you know, for example, like uh, uh, the, in the military field, uh, the big countries and uh, the country who get uh, lots of budget for the arm armament, uh, they already created uh, HGV missiles, which is a very high speed, uh, long range missiles. And uh, we cannot stop those kind of uh, high-speed, uh, very aggressive, massive uh, attacks. And uh, if we want to stop those high technologies, we have to create and uh, pro we have to prepare the protection of the outer space. But if you look up the sky and see the outer space, we have uh, lots of already problems and issues. And uh, you can see the uh, lots of types uh, of their space, uh, and that um, the Chinese, uh, the space agency, already launched uh, lots of killer satellites, and uh, they launched satellites, and uh, after that they destroy their own satellite and make lots of space debris. Also, you can see this graph, and that's really in increasing the number of the space debris. So why not the European countries and the Japan and United States collaborating to protect of the, the peace and stability of the outer space issues? So we have a lots of capabilities and uh, chances uh, for the future between collaborating with European Union, European countries, and also the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you came prepared. You got maps, you got charts, you got <laughs> graphs. Um, we have a Zoom question now, so we will go to that. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beatrice. I'm from Australia as part of the Global Voices program. First of all, thank you for such an informative discussion that we're having today. My question is, um, you've mentioned communities of democracies, and it's been mentioned um, a couple of times during this week. Uh, my question is, would the community of democracy survive another um, administration such as Trump, given the recent rise in popul populism that we've, we've seen? I am going to go to my fellow American to take Beatrice's excellent question. Tori. <laughs> Thank you, Beatrice. It's a great question. I mean, if you ask uh, President Biden, I think he would say that he ran on the very notion that American democracy was fledgling and that it wouldn't survive a second term of the Trump administration. Um, but but I think there's a, a broader point um, to be addressed here in your question, Beatrice, and that's that um, democracies are challenged from within and from without. Um, I think during the Trump administration, there was this focus on um, resurgent authoritarianism around the world and looking at challenges from Russia, China, Iran, North Korea as kind of an axis of authoritarian powers. But there was no recognition, um, you know, maybe for cynical reasons about uh, declining democracy from within. And I think that notion has been flipped on its head in this new administration. We recognize that we have uh, significant uh, weaknesses within our own democracy, not just in the United States, but in our alliances and partnerships around the world, and that we have to strengthen our democratic resilience in order to speak with a collective voice abroad. Um, you know, we have this summit for democracy taking place ostensibly in the next year or so at some point in 2022. I think that there are going to be a lot of issues addressed there. Uh, first and foremost, who goes? Um, how do we uh, count democracies as democracies. I'm glad I'm not planning that because I think that would be a difficult issue to address. But but I do think, just to, to go back to your question, that there is a recognition that our democracies have been weakened from within by forces of populism, nationalism, and that we need to recognize these internal weaknesses in order to compete with authoritarian powers abroad. I think that's two sides of the coin that uh, really need to be addressed if we're going to compete successfully um, with authoritarian powers, whether that be Russia, China, or others. Thank you so much. Yes, we will see who is at, who is at the summit. And if, uh, as Bruno suggested at some point, the United States gets more flexible as to who's allowed in its, in its democratic club. I very quickly, we have just a few minutes left, but very quickly, I'd like to put this question uh, to the Europeans. Do you think that this sort of um, pro-democratic, transatlantic stance against China and Russia and great power and, and our great power universe, right? We've learned that it's not just the world, it's also in space. Um, does that survive if, if Trump or someone like Trump is back in 2024? Very quickly. Can I disagree with the question? Of course, yeah. Because, I, you know, I think that's, that's not really the main question. For me, the main question is the rise of China in particular and the way it's affecting the global system. What we saw in the last two, three years was a kind of... Um, failure of enforcing global norms mm. um, on a scale that we hadn't seen before. So remember when the Hong Kong protests started, the sort of educated opinion in, in Western uh, media and, and commentary it was, there is no way that China can respond to this. Uh, it lost control over Hong Kong. And that's kind of the reaction we had 20, 30 years ago, that an authoritarian state could not react to such uh, widespread protests. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the solution was, to bring the military in, right. and that would have unintended consequences. Well, I think, you know, we've been learning that things are a bit more complicated uh, and that this power of enforcement uh, coming from global democracies is much weakened. China was able to control the dissent in Hong Kong. Uh, we see in Belarus even more shocking mm -hmm. that a small country like Belarus was able to put an end to the protests. And so really for me, the question, and I'm sorry to say this, it might not sound popular, is actually a question of power distribution uh, and the way we have to uh, marshal new sources of power, find new allies, uh, if we want to have a, a stable global balance of power. Because what's happening, it seems clear to me, is that countries like China and like Russia are testing the limits and mm. becoming increasingly confident that there are no consequences to a number of actions. Navalny is another great right. example. Um, 
So every month uh, or every couple of months, we see how this global order is eroding All further right. and further. Well, on that optimistic note, let's just very quickly check in with our poll results. Producers, can we see the poll? There we go. Uh, no, that's a quick, I need to hit poll. Uh, we have, the question was, what percentage of Central, Central and Eastern Europeans is worried about China's rising economic power? 47%, no, it's, it's roughly 50-50, right, I think, if I'm reading that right. Anyway, um, in just a second, we will continue in this very room with a session called Political Leadership in Climate Change. United we stand. So don't go anywhere, we'll be back after a short video. But first, please join me in thanking Tori, Kinga, Bruno, Minister Nakayama. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. We hope you enjoyed great power competition. Thank you.